Bibles to John, the third chapter. I'm going to be taking my text. It's 1 through 21. And uh, this morning, 1 through 12, but I'm going to go through 21 in, my, in this. So go to 1 through 12. The rest of it's all mine, so I'm going to give it to you as God gives it to me. Yeah, I want you to know this morning that God has a plan for you. God has a future for you, and God knows your future. And God also knows what you're going to be before you are what you're going to be. And God knows what you're going to do, and God knows what you're not going to do. Okay? So he knows how much you're going to do for him. He knows how far you'll go for him. And he'll know, he also knows what you're going to, you know, suffer for him. And if we don't suffer for Christ, then we can't be his disciple. I know that all the disciples suffered for Christ. They suffered and they paid a price for him. And if we can't pay a price for Christ to come even to church on a Sunday morning and listen to an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours, you know what? We're not suffering for Christ. We are embellishing all of our needs and wishes and our wants and we're, we're taking it all and we're taking it for ourselves. So I'm going to be preaching this morning about how people are living for themselves. They are not living for Jesus Christ. They claim to be Christians, but they have no power thereof. And they're denying the power. And today, that's where we're at. Brother Dan was talking this morning about our United States. We're, we're, in, a bad, we're in bad shape. We are in a, we're in a very bad condition. And we are sinking, just like the Titanic. We are going down. But I understand and know that God is faithful to his, his people, to the ones that are true Christians, God will be faithful to us. And do, will we have to endure hardship? Yes. Will we go through trials and tribulation? Yes. Did his disciples go through trials and tribulation? Yes. They absolutely did. In fact, they gave their lives. They had to die. They were martyred for Jesus Christ. John's the only one that was on the island of Patmos and he was taken off the island of Patmos and he was taken and put back in Ephesus and he lived out his days and he died of old age. Amen. God spared him from not having to suffer the, the cross and suffer beheading and suffer being cut in two and boiled in oil and all the things that happened to his, his disciples. Then, you know, we know that we're going to suffer some persecution. Amen. Amen. But the thing is, we stay steadfast to the end. We stay rock solid with Jesus Christ. I want to tell you a story this morning. And the title of my message this morning is, Are You Leaking? Are You Leaking? Do we have holes in our theocracy? Do we have holes in our in the word? Do we have holes in our, our gospel? Do we have holes in us? Are we leaking out everything that we hear and what we've been taught and what we read in the Bible? Is it just leaking out as fast as it's been being put in? You know, we can come to church and listen and sit and be taught in Sunday school. We can have adult Sunday school class. We can have a children's church. We can do all that. And we can have preaching of the word. When the people go back out, it's just like it comes and it goes and it's gone. Or are we retaining all that and holding on to it? So I'm going to just ask you a question this morning. Are you leaking? You can answer that yourself. I want to talk to you about a guy named Johnny. So Johnny liked his Jack Daniels. Every Saturday night, he had polished off a fifth and howl at the moon. You know how, how you, you get drunk, you just do crazy things. It said, but Johnny was a born-again Christian. Now, hold on. Don't judge Johnny yet. I mean, we're already saying, oh, Johnny. All right? And one Sunday morning, he was in the back of his church when he heard the preacher make the call for repentance and the altar call. Sure enough, Johnny came down the aisle, tears streaming down his face, crying out, fill me, Lord. Fill me, Jesus. The next Saturday night, he tied on another one. Sunday, the preacher started all the call, and here comes Johnny again. Fill me, Jesus. Oh, fill me. Another Saturday night, another fifth of Jack Daniels. The next Sunday, like clockwork, here comes Johnny. Fill me, Lord. Fill me. Oh, Lord Jesus, fill me. And from the balcony, a voice cried out, Don't do it, Lord. He's got a leak. He's leaking. So everything that went in on Sunday by, you know, Saturday night, he was leaking. It all went away. The conviction of the message and of him being in church and going to the altar and, and repenting all over again was leaking back out. 
By, you know, within six days, he was already back to where he was, and he wouldn't give up the bottle. Amen. People are today are not giving up the bottle. They're not giving up the things of the world. They're allowing them things to hold them back and keep them from serving Jesus Christ like he wants them to. I don't know what God thinks of that and how God's going to do it because I am not the judge of anyone and I cannot judge them. I told a lady the other day, she, we were talking about, she was telling me that, oh, these people are going to go to hell and these are not going to make it and these are, oh, I just know. I said, you're not their judge. You cannot judge them. Jesus Christ said not to hurt my little ones. He said, if you do, you might as well just go and tie a millstone around your neck and drown yourself. Right. I said, because you are not their judge. You cannot send them to hell. Well, I know what they do, and I know they're doing wrong. I said, but you're not Jesus. You're not God. You're not the one that can come and take them and put them in hell. That's God's job. And you don't judge them. You, you pray for them. The Bible says pray for them. Amen. Amen? They need to pray for Johnny. Johnny would seal up the leak and quit letting it leak out on Sunday. By the time he got home, he'd already let it all leak out. Everything was gone from the, from the message and everything that happened and from the altar and getting up off his knees and giving his life back to Jesus and he goes right back out and did it again. Oh, there's remission of sin. Oh, believe me, and God forgives. But there's a time when God will take us and turn us into a sense to over to a reprobate mind to do what things are convenient for us and what we like to do and what we are not going to adhere to the word and to the laws of God. And God just says, all right, I'm going to turn you to a reprobate mind. Go ahead. Do what you want to do. You take a rebellious child and you correct them. You can spank them. You can whip them. You can, do, you can take things away. You can correct that child. If it continues to do it and you can't stop it, you cannot make it do those things. I mean, you've done everything you can. God did everything he could by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us that we may have remission of sin, but we don't adhere to the laws of God and obey the commandments and do what God told us, then shame on us. It's nothing to do with God. God does not send us to hell. We send ourselves. Amen? In John chapter 3, verse 1, it said there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now here's Nicodemus in the fourth verse, and he's not understanding, and he can't, how can, how can a man enter the second time in his mother's womb? How can he be born again? He's not getting it. He's not understanding the spiritual aspect of what Jesus is trying to tell him. And Jesus is coming in a spiritual way and telling him and help, trying to get him to understand. But see, here it is. He's an educated man. Nicodemus is. He's a Pharisee. He's of the Sanhedrin. I mean, he is a ruler. I mean, he's not only a ruler. He's, he's like a, he would be like a Roman, Roman Catholic priest that, or, and he would, or a cardinal. And a senator all rolled into one because he had the he had the church and he had the law. He had both things working for him, and he had power and he had he had respect in his community because of who he was. And here he is, an educated man, but yet he cannot get the spiritual aspect of what Jesus is saying that ye must be born again. And so Jesus has to go deeper into the truth of why we are born again and how we are to try to get Nicodemus to understand what he's talking about, and he still doesn't get it. There's so many people that come and they sit in church and they're just shaking their head like, what are you talking about? I don't know because I know what to tell you because I know that this right here, this is a spiritual word. It's not, it's not fleshly known. You cannot discern this in the flesh. You have to have a spiritual aspect of meaning of this word to get in the word and then therefore God comes and he delivers it to you and he reveals it to your mind and opens up our puny mind to let us understand and know what he wants us to do. And he takes and he breaks it down for us. Here's Nicodemus not even understanding what Jesus said. Let's, let's go on. In the fourth verse, Nicodemus says unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? He said, How can that be? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's asking Jesus a question. How can that be? And Jesus is probably just like, 
Nicodemus. You're educated. How do you not understand this? But I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to take it further than that to get you to understand. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you this morning for this message. Jesus, over 2,000 years ago, you stood on this earth. And Jesus, as you was talking to Nicodemus, I can just see now, God, that you're just wanting to give him, oh God, an understanding of all the things the Jews believed and what they took the law and they could not get past the laws. And he could not get past the point and the fact that you were the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, Jesus. You were the Son of God. Nicodemus perceived you to be a prophet, but nothing else. And today I recognize and I acknowledge you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus, I see you as the Holy One of Israel, the Righteous One. I see you as the one that's coming back to redeem a people. And God, I know that we must be holy and acceptable in you. It says without spot or blemish. And I'm calling upon you this morning to send your Holy Spirit. To open our hearts and minds. God, let us understand your word as I preach this morning. Reveal it to those listening and everyone that's listening to this outside of these four walls. That they will understand that we must be born again. And if we're not, we will not rise when you come to raptures. And Jesus, we will not be ready to come when you come. Back to rapture, rapture your people. Help us this morning to understand. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. First of all, see, we see Nicodemus come to Jesus by night. Because he's afraid of the Jews. He's afraid of the Pharisees. He's afraid of uh, ridicule. He was afraid of anybody seeing him to come to talk to Jesus. He was trying to hide the fact that he wanted to go and get some answers from Jesus because everybody said that he was a blasphemer. He was not the Lord. And the Pharisees would have maybe taken him off the Sanhedrin council if they caught him talking to Jesus. So he comes by night. And he comes so no one will know what he's doing. His word in verse 2 are telling us by calling Jesus rabbi, he confers great respect treating Jesus as a peer. So he knows that Jesus is a great man. He knows that Jesus is a rabbi. He called him rabbi. And nobody calls, you know, without having respect for one. In them days, they didn't call anybody rabbi, which was a teacher of the laws and a ruler of the people. And he called him rabbi. So he knew that he was somebody. But what he couldn't get in his mind is the fact that he was not just somebody. He was Jesus Christ. He was the one that came and he was born of the Virgin Mary. He come, had to come to the fact that that's the one that Jesus sent to die for our sins. And he didn't understand that. He could not understand and get that in his mind. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. The council of 70 men that provided spiritual leadership to Israel. Now I want to tell you about the Sanhedrin Council. The one that when Stephen... Anybody knows who Stephen was in the Bible? He was, one of the, he was one of the followers of Christ. He was a Gentile, yet he followed Christ and he followed Jesus Christ. He didn't follow the law. He didn't follow the Jews. He didn't follow those things they said in those days they should follow to be what they needed to be for God. Amen? They took him and they put him in the council of the 70 of the Sanhedrin court. And they all conferred together that he was a blasphemer, and they even paid men outside to come in and to testify against Stephen and, and say, yes, he's a blasphemer. He blasphemed our God in heaven, and he deserves nothing but death. So they all voted, the 70 voted, and the Saul, which was Saul then, who turned to Apostle Paul, was there in the courtroom, and they told him, you will die, you have to be stoned to death. Matter of fact, Apostle Paul took and held his cloak, while they took him outside the walls and they took him out and they began to stone him. And the Sanhedrin were all there and they partook of all the rocks and picking up and throwing them at Stephen and continued to bash him in the head until he was dying. And Stephen looked up in his last breath and he said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he died. 
So we see who the Sanhedrin was and what they did. And here Nicodemus, is a, he was a part of that also. He was one of the ones that said, yes, stone him to death and kill him. So here he is saying, you know, kill the one that's talking about this man that I call a rabbi. Because Jesus Christ, he follows him and he is not Jesus and he is not the son of God and he cannot be the son of God. And he's saying, how could you be the son of God when you're a mere man born of a woman? He couldn't get that in his mind. At that time, they were also a powerful political entity that essentially they ruled Judea. The southern province Israel, it included Jerusalem, so they ruled all this. The Sanhedrin, were they were the ones. They would be like our Congress today, that they made the laws and they put them into effect and them and the president set it all in force and they enforced it. And the people came and lived by those laws that they made. And matter of fact, it became so hard to live by law, they couldn't even live by them themselves. We see all the time that congressmen are caught in sin. Senators are caught in sin. Everyone in the, in the White House, people that are of high authority are caught in sin and they're caught and it's brought to the open because God, God's going to reveal it. Here Nicodemus is asking Jesus and trying to get some answers and he still, when he walks away, doesn't have the answer yet. The prestige held by Nicodemus was like a combination of a Roman Catholic cardinal and a U.S. senator all rolled in move because he had both spiritual and political authority. He had all that. But yet he couldn't understand something Jesus told him about being born again. Jesus answered and he said, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I'm going to tell you right now. If we walk in the flesh, Apostle Paul said this, if you walk in the flesh, you're going to be flesh. You're going to do fleshy things. You will never be able to achieve and acquire the spiritual things of God if you walk in the flesh. If you don't keep yourself under the blood of Jesus and forgiven of your sins, you're going to do all the fleshly things his body tells you to do and your mind tells you to do because you're going to override God every time the conviction comes. You're going to do what you want to do. People did what they wanted to do this morning because they didn't even bother to come to the house of the Lord. They decided to stay home because it's easier to stay home and they can do what they want to do at home and go places they want to go rather than obey the Spirit and say, I'm going to church no matter what. I'm not letting nothing stop me. I'm not going to do anything to harm my Jesus and not come to, and go to church. It's the way it is. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit becomes a spiritual being one-on-one -on -one with God. It comes to know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. And therefore we are led as sons and daughters by the Holy Spirit. Our convictions will be such that we cannot override the spirit when he comes to tell us that sin that we turn and we walk away from it. We don't allow that to reign in our mortal body. When it comes in and it stays and we conceive it and put it in our mind, conceive it in our heart, it becomes sin. If we don't get out of that sin and repent from the sin, we will be left behind if Jesus Christ comes. If we take our last breath and something happens, we're not going to make it. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's hard, isn't it? But that's the truth. That which is born... He said his flesh. That which is born of the spirit of the spirit is telling him, Nicodemus, come on. Get this in your heart and mind. I'm not talking about a, a earthly thing here. I'm not talking about you being born of your mother. Who, I mean, everybody knows you can't go into the mother's womb for the second time when you're old. I mean, come on. Common sense will tell you, Nicodemus, that... I'm talking about something from heaven, a spiritual thing that comes and it, it takes the old man and you die out to that sin and then you become a new creature in me. And, and he, he was talking about himself and Nicodemus had a hard time about Jesus talking about him, you know, coming and being born in the spirit of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and becoming a new man. He couldn't get that in his heart and mind. We better get it in our heart today that if we're not saved, that we are in danger of hellfire. I'll 
them outside these walls that are doing what they want to do and they give God no regard and they never even think about Jesus or anything else, they've got a rude awakening coming if they take their last breath or Jesus Christ comes back. They'll be left behind. He said, marvel not. He said, don't let it twist your mind. Don't let it. Don't marvel. Don't let it confuse you. He said, don't let this confuse you what I'm saying. Get it in your mind. And, and you know what? Come on, you're smarter than that, Nicodemus. I'm sure Jesus just wanted to say, Nicodemus, come on. Wake up. You're a smart man. You've got to understand this. You ought to know. You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listens, and now hearest the sound thereof. He said, when the wind comes and it blows, you know the wind's coming. You can feel it come and you feel it go. You can feel it press against your skin. And you know it's coming and you hear it. You can hear the wind howl and you know it's there. He said, but can't tell where it cometh and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You don't know where it comes from. How do you know where it's coming from? But you know it's coming. And you feel the Spirit come into you, Nicodemus. Come on. Let God fill you with my Spirit, with the Spirit that you need. You'll feel that coming. You know where it came from because it came from nowhere but God. When we get down on our knees and we start to pray and we get in an attitude of worship and prayer. I don't know about you, but I feel the Spirit coming and I know it's coming. And, and when it does, it just saturates me and I, I just, you know, I get excited. I get happy. Tears start flowing. No, that's God's spirit. I'm feeling, I'm having a, I'm having a revival right here by myself. I'm feeling the power of God. And God has come to fill me with his spirit. You can be in your car driving down the road and people pull up and you're just crying. You got your hands up in the air and, and tears are flowing down. They look over and say, look at that crazy person. You roll down your window and say, yeah, I am crazy. I'm crazy about my Jesus. Amen. That's what I'm crazy about. And you don't let that affect you or don't let people bother you because they will go to a ball game and scream and jump up and down and they'll worship a football and holler and yell and do all that stuff and not be embarrassed of everybody standing around them. We can't be ashamed of our Jesus. Amen? Amen. He said, you don't know where it goeth. So everyone that is born, they're born of the Spirit. He's trying to tell Nicodemus, he said, this is a spiritual rebirth. You're, you are dying out to the old man. Apostle Paul said, I die daily. He said, I go back to the cross every single day of my life because I know that I'm fighting a fight. I'm fighting against an enemy. The devil, Satan, has come like a roaring lion, come to kill, steal, and destroy. And he said, I recognize him when he comes because he comes to test me and try me and tempt me. And I know with evil is present. He said, when I do, go to do good, I do not do good. When I go to do those things that I know that God wants, he said, I have an evil one present to try to keep me from doing it. And so he said, I'm in the fight of my life. And he said, I'm fighting. I'm struggling to keep my spiritual level of God in my life, and I need him every day. And I've got to wake up in the morning, I've got to go back to the cross and I've got to die back out to Jesus Christ one more time every single day. This is not a once a week experience. This is not something you come to church one week and then you don't come for two or three weeks and then you come back expecting yourself to be as spiritual as you was when you left. And expect God just to honor you just as much as he did when you came three or four weeks ago. I'm sorry. Well, you can, I can pray at home. I can pray in my car. I can do all everything that I can do in church, and I really don't need church. I can do it without that church. That's a waste of my time. I can take you, the scripture says this, forsake not to assembling yourselves together in my house. See, God said, assemble yourselves. Get yourself where everybody else is so we can worship God and, and we can come together and we can get an attitude of worship and praise. Yeah, you can do it at home. But is God pleased? I'll just tell you that. He was a man who commanded respect. And he was probably used to being respected. 
So his words here convey a great deal of respect, and he indicates that he is prepared to accept Jesus as a prophet. He, he'll accept him as a prophet, but not as the Son of God. So Jesus responds to Nicodemus by telling him that one must be born again. One needs a new birth. With the spirit oriented away from sin and toward God, you have to turn away from the sin and turn, turn towards God. When Nicodemus didn't understand, he doesn't understand this, that Jesus clarifies saying that one must be born of the spirit. He had to somehow get that into his spirit that, yeah, now I understand he's telling me that I can't go back into the mother's womb since I'm old, but I can be born again of the spirit. And we see Nicodemus struggling with this and trying to grasp the fact that Jesus said he had to be born again. Nicodemus still doesn't get it. Jesus gets even more straightforward telling Nicodemus his identity and what he must do. He must believe in the Son of Man, namely Jesus, in order to get this new birth. In John 2 and 23 through 25, it says this, the people believed only after they saw signs. Back in the second chapter of John, the people would only believe. They would gather together and, and Jesus, they had to see a sign from Jesus to believe and know that he was the Christ. They wouldn't believe in him until he performed miracles and he did all that he did. And then they said, oh, surely he must be the Christ because only the way that he could do that is through God. And then they would believe, so they had to have a sign. And they didn't entrust him. They, they just didn't know what to do. They had to, they had to have signs, and they knew that it was in a man. And Jesus said, this is in a man. What is in humanity? Let me tell you what's in humanity. Self-deception, self-serving interests, pride. The desire to place ourselves at the center of our own life rather than to place ourselves at the center of God's house. The theological term for that is called sin. Not just sins that are individual acts violating God's law, but sin which stains and corrupts our whole nature. Our universe is stained by sin. Our United States is stained by sin. And it says there we have principalities and powers in high places. We have so much sin in high places today in our government, it's terrible. We see it happening right before our very eyes and God has come to show us and to give us signs in the last days these things shall come to place. These things shall happen and we see our, our United States where we live falling apart. We see nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We see wars and, and uh, rumors of wars all over this earth. Wake up, wake up, wake up. We're in the last days. In Romans 3, 23, 26, for all have sinned. Apostle Paul said this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You're probably saying, what is propitiation? What in the world is that? Let me tell you what it is. Propitiation is the act of God, motivated by his immense love, whereby he accepts the blood of Christ as the complete and satisfying sacrifice for all human sin. Thus established a means of reconciliation between God and man. He reconciled between man and and himself by the blood of Jesus Christ when he went to the cross and he died and he gave his own blood for us. That he was a supreme sacrifice. He was the lamb to the slaughter. And therefore God could come and say, now I'm giving you propitiation. I am giving back that and I am accepting that as your sins to be forgiven as easy as you ask for forgiveness of my son Jesus Christ. Therefore you are saved. How much easier could he made it for us? How much more could God do to make sure that people don't go into the devil's hell? He's trying to keep you out. He's not trying to put people in there. Everybody says, oh, God's sending everybody to hell. They're just so wicked. No, he's not. He's trying to keep everybody out. So I can take you into John 3, 16, and you know what it says. 
For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, He that believe in Him shall not perish. Listen to that. Shall not perish. He doesn't want you to perish. But he said, I want you to have everlasting life. He wants you to have life in heaven with him. He's trying everything he can to get you into the heavenly places. But we've got to stay in the spirit of God. We have to be born again. We have to not be like Nicodemus and just sit and shake our head like, what do you want me to do now, God? I'm just, you know, I'm here. And then we don't do nothing about it. Nothing. We just sit idle and don't do anything. Jesus Christ come and he said, I must be busy about my father's business. You do it too. Get busy about my business. In John 2 and 1, it says, My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You have an advocate with the Father. You have your sins so easily forgiven if, if we are sincere and come and in the heart, right heart and mind. And you know what? You can't do it just knowing you're going to be like Johnny. You're going to go right back out and grab your bottle of Jack Daniels and you're going to down it again. Come back to church on Sunday, run to the altar and ask God to forgive your sins. And then, you know what? You're, oh, you're, you're just happy because you're forgiven the sin. And you go back out and the next Saturday night you grab that bottle and drink it again. Come back to church. Are we like Johnny? Are, are we have a leak? Are we leaking? Mm. Amen. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, I'll tell you what, that blood, the blood that Jesus, how many pints of blood do we have? That went, covered the whole world. You ever see that Sherman Williams, they have their logo, they got the whole world, the paint cans up here and the dumps and it's going over the whole world, covering the world. Come on, nobody seen that? All right. Sherman Williams' logo is the paint can it dumps onto the world and it's covered and it's going down all over the world. That means their, their business is covering the world. They're selling Sherman Williams paint everywhere. I want to take that and make an example that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, yeah, it was only his blood, but when it flowed down and it touched the earth, the earth shook, it trembled. That blood was enough to cover the whole world and all the sin of the whole world. And I don't care if this world goes on for another 100 years, 200 years. I don't know what God's got planned. I don't know. I, I think it's real soon. But I don't know. Jesus said, disciples asking when, he said, the angels don't know the time of my return. I don't even know. He said, only God knows. So God's only one knows the time and the date. He's got, he's got it set. He's got his, if you would have, he's got a spiritual clock. And he's got that clock set to the hour, the minute, the second that he's going to tell Jesus, rapture your church. And Jesus is going to say, are you sure, Lord? Is it time? I mean, it's been a thousand years, Lord. God's going to say, now's the time. And Jesus will say, yes, yes, God. He's going to step on the clouds of glory. He's going to rapture his church. But his blood covered the whole world for the sins, the remission of sin for the whole world. Not just for some, not just for the Jews, not just for some, but for all. And I'm talking about every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every denomination. Come on now. You hear what I said? Every denomination, every church, every nationality. So oh, wait a minute, there's some that's not going to make it. How do you know? Come on, we're not their judge, are we? We cannot judge anybody. If they call upon the name of Jesus Christ, they shall be saved. Bottom line. That's what he's trying to tell Nicodemus. Amen? Now, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. And the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Here Paul gives us a lesson of what is in man. Establishing the fact of the corrupt human nature... From the scriptures. Man is corrupt. Man is very sinful. The Bible says this. It comes and it tells us. In the last days. There will be a generation of vipers. Talking about our youth. Our young people coming up. If we don't 
get busy and we don't teach our youth and tell them about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, we don't teach them the Holy Word, that's the church of tomorrow. And if we lose that, then we've lost it all because we're going to go back in before John Wesley came back and said, I'm going to get the Holy Ghost back. I'm going to start a revival and bring back the Holy Spirit and I am going to get it into the church and into the people if it kills me. And he said this, he said, if we get on fire, he said, come on, the church will come to watch us burn. People will come to watch us burn. Denomination will come to watch us burn. That was the Methodist movement. And guess where the Methodists are now? They reverted right back to where they were before John Wesley came and said, let's get on fire. Let's get the Holy Ghost back in our services. They reverted right back to where they were before he got on the, came on the scene. Before he brought it over into the United States, they went right back. See how easy it is for us to just sit back in our lazy chair and do nothing and just let it all slip away from us? How easy it is for our churches to allow the Holy Spirit to just fade away from our churches and not keep it alive? Oh, he won't come if you don't want him. He won't show up if you don't want him. If you don't want him, he won't come. It has to be desire from our bottom of our heart that we say, Jesus, we need your Holy Spirit. Send the Holy Spirit and just fill us. Send down the rain, Lord. Send down that latter rain. Give it to us. We want it. It has to be that desire that we want it all. Paul gives a lesson of what man has established, the fact that corrupt human nature from the scriptures. That's what was in the man that Jesus saw so clearly. He saw that Nicodemus was just a man. He was a man with earthly thoughts and with fleshly thoughts and could not adhere to the what he was trying to tell him that it was a spiritual rebirth. That's what was in Nicodemus despite his greatness and his prestige and his community. That's what is in you and me also. If we allow to, that's what's going to be in us. We are going to be flesh and we are going to do fleshly things. Nicodemus in chapter 3 comes to Jesus without any change evident in his life, what I just preached. But we can go to, in John chapter 7, verse 50, a change is observable in that he defends Jesus against the charge of the Sanhedrin court. When they come to say that Jesus is a blasphemer, they come to bring charges against Jesus and the Sanhedrin all come against him and they are, they are on him. Guess who stands up for him? Nicodemus comes to Jesus' defense and tries to defend Jesus Christ. He is going against all that he has been taught, all the law of the Sanhedrin and what he is a Pharisee and what he was, that he come to defend Jesus Christ and say, He is the Lord and He is God. He is, he is incarnate. He is Jesus. He is the Lord. And he came to do that in that chapter in the 50th verse, in the 7th chapter, and he said, I am defending Jesus Christ. He, he went against. He could be put to death for that. He could have been kicked out of Sanhedrin. He would have been out of a job. He wouldn't have had a job no more. He put everything on the line for Jesus. Just from the third chapter to the seventh chapter, the time the span that went by, he decided that he, he would probably went home and thought about everything Jesus had said. And I believe the Holy Spirit come and just helped him to understand and know that, yes, I, know, I understand now. I know that I have to be born again of the Spirit. And I've got to accept that, and Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords. At the crucifixion, Nic Nicodemus boldly and publicly stands as one of Jesus Christ's disciples at the foot of the cross. Look at that. See what he did? He came not understanding how he could be born again. But over time, God God revealed to Nicodemus. He put it in his spirit and he showed him that the man that he was talking to, Jesus Christ, is the one he had to accept as the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. If people don't accept him today and they don't know that they have to pray to Jesus, then they're lost. They're in trouble. Jesus Christ said, no man comes to the Father except through the Son. You cannot be saved. You cannot get into heaven without going through Jesus. Amen. You cannot. There's no way possible. People believe that they can go and they can go to a father and get their sins forgiven. They can just ask 
Father, forgive me for I've sinned. They can go and they can pray to just God. God, forgive me my sins. It, don't, it doesn't work. It's not going to help them. God is leading us to his son, Jesus Christ, this morning. And I want to ask you this. What are you going to do with him? God has given you Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus? You can take him and just put him on a shelf and go and get him every time you need him. You can try to call out to him when trouble comes and something happens and you need him then. The bottom falls out. Then you're going to call on him. He might just say, you know, where, where, where were you when I needed you? Amen. Where were you when I needed you to do all the things I asked you to do and I put it in your heart and your spirit to do these things and you haven't done it for me? Where were you when I called you in the midnight hour and told you to get up and get on your knees and pray and you wouldn't do it? Where were you when you were in the shopping mall and somebody came up and sat next to you and I, I put it in your spirit to tell them about my son Jesus Christ and you didn't do it? Where were you when I told you to witness to your loved ones at Christmas when they were there and you didn't do it? Where, where were you when I needed you to just pray for somebody in the middle of the night when I woke you up and you wouldn't do it? Where were you? Why should I come running to your aid every time you cry out to me because now you're in trouble and you need me, but you didn't need me before? You have put my son on a shelf and put him there and said, stay there till I need you and I'll come and get you. We do that all the time. We just take for granted that Jesus is always going to be there. Anytime I need help, all I got to do is run to Jesus because if I can't get, if I can't do it myself or somebody's not there to help me and do it for me and I, my resources run out, that's my last resource and then I'll go to Jesus. My God, we are missing. We are missing. Jesus Christ told Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus. You must have the Spirit of God in your life. Do you, how much of the Spirit of God do we have? I mean, God knows how much you got. We're not fooling him, are we? We're not going to fool God. He knows. Amen? Thank mm -hmm. you.